I watch it all the time. I love watching the uh, the OTB shows uh, with the personalities, and then I watch the when I'm at home. I've got it all watching the races, uh, and it's great now that they've got the uh, re replay of it live. You know, like two or three minutes after after post, so you know they fl flip it off and two minutes I'm gonna get to see the live race so I always take my program home with me and but if I'm not back at the barn I'm watching it at home. Gravel has a short lead. Sleek Hunter is second, then All Man. Apache Road back toward the rail. Prom Shoes on the grandstand side. Vinyl Furlong for Ravel under jockey Garrett Gomez. A widening three length lead. Back to Prom Shoes on the grandstand side. And then All Man between horses. Sleek Hunter toward the rail, but Ravel will take it. Heavily favored Ravel draws off to win it by some five lengths. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. Along with my colleague, Mike Veach, the racing columnist with the Saratogian, I'm Mark Cassano, welcoming you to our December 8th edition of the program. And over the next 60 minutes, well, you just took a look at Ravel in his comeback race back in October at Keeneland. Ravel takes his next step forward later this afternoon, going in the Native Diver, and we will take a look at that race as we open the show. Then we'll go back to last evening. Take a look at a very exciting renewal was, of the Grade 3 Delta Jackpot. We'll answer your emails, and we will also welcome in a pair of special guests. Two-time Eclipse Award-winning photographer Barbara Livingston will join us, and she has a new book, and we will chat with her about that book. And then later on, this is opening day at Tampa Bay Downs. And Tampa Bay Downs has found a niche in the racing industry. They have been highly successful over the past five or six years, and we'll chat with their Vice President of Marketing and Publicity, Margot Flynn, later on. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us for our December 8th, 2007 edition of Down the Stretch. Partner, good morning. Well, good morning to you, and I am interested in learning from Margo about uh, Tampa Bay. I agree with you that it's, uh, it's, been a, it's one of those tracks that uh, has just made a little money every year and gone oh. forward and they had a tremendous renewal of the Tampa Bay Derby last year and uh, this will be interesting to find out uh, you know their perspective on things because uh, not many tracks really <laughs> you know you can probably count on one hand the number of particularly smaller tracks who gradually keep oh, going forward absolutely. over years so good for them so absolutely. that's going to be interesting they have found a niche i don't know how they've done it but they've been very very no, successful no, I agree. that's that's we'll nice talk to, to margo racing it really about is. that everything else okay yeah every, everything's good i kind of the delta jackpot i stayed up late last night i was the guy getting beat up in the middle between well, the, if you haven't seen this finish you're going to enjoy it well we'll, <laughs> so. we'll see that uh, sandwich in uh, just yeah. a couple of moments <laughs> As I mentioned, um, I decided to use Ravel for this morning's Open. Ravel comes back later this afternoon in the Native Diver and is actually the only three-year-old in against a group of older horses. Uh, let's take a look at Ravel earlier this year. He is at the top of your screen, fourth on the fence, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Sham Stakes going nine furlongs, today's native diver distance. Of course, this was at Santa Anita. Ravel, uh, after the sham stakes, was sidelined with a, a hairline fracture to his left front cannon bone. And when he went to the sidelines, folks, he was very, very high on my list of derby prospects. I mean, he was two or three. I like this colt a lot. He's the son of Fusaichi Pegasus. They paid just about a million for him. And while he's had his campaign interrupted because of those injuries, they're looking ahead to the big cap and they're gonna use the native diver and then one other race to get him there. 
And partner, I don't mind telling yeah. you, I am very high on this. No, I know, I know you have been all along. He's, he's really is exciting, and he's a grand-looking horse from a really talented and very popular and brilliant family a generation ago, that of Arazi and fabulous partner, and I think that it was the Wilson family at the time. But, you know, he'll get tested a little more today, but, gosh, to see him come back and hopefully be healthy is going to be interesting. And this is, uh, you couldn't pick a better spot to get going, really, if you're going to stay on this path to the Santa Anita Handicap. Folks, he's two and a half to one in the program, and, you know, I've always been the first to say that morning line odds, you know, can be highly overrated if they're not terribly accurate. You know, I think if you can get two to one on him, I think he's a very good bet this afternoon. I just think he's an exceptionally talented racehorse who showed me with that uh, non-winners two other than victory at Keeneland back on October 12th that he has gotten over that injury. Mm -hmm. He's been working forwardly for this. And, you know, I think I said it a little bit earlier, a lot of people would consider the only three-year-old in a field against their elders to be a disadvantage I think it's a huge advantage. When you think about this year's crop of three-year-olds, they lay over the well, old Well, as I said last week, it's been a mop-up campaign yeah. for almost all of them. And I think he's right there with the forefront of the good ones. And by the way, he's won on both surfaces, which is to his credit. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. I really yeah, I think he's going to run big this afternoon. Let's hope we can get at least two to one on Ravel in the Native Diver. All right. Three emails to read for you and to respond. Partner, go to it. Well, we will start with uh, Pat from Albany. Dear Mark and Mike, after listening to your comments on the graded stakes, I was wondering if you could make an attempt to get someone from the graded stakes committee to come on and answer a few questions. As a longtime viewer, I know that you have in the past to no avail. Perhaps if they knew there are racing fans that are interested in knowing how they make decisions on upgrades or downgrades, they might consider coming on. And if you can get them to agree, could you let us know in advance like you do with the Breeders' Cup? I, for one, have a lot of questions. Well, Pat, Pat. you have been a longtime viewer, but uh, we did have a member of the Graded Stakes Committee on last year. Now, you know, I approached my partner to help me with this uh, name I, and our associate I'm producer, sorry. Julie Hoxie, yeah. and they both came up empty. I think it was Andy Schweigert because I remember... Yeah. The gentleman that we had on, and I'm pretty sure it was Andy, had local connections. He had gone to high school mm -hmm. in this area, at, you know, CBA or LaSalle mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. So we have had a, a member of the Graded Stakes Committee on. Pat, and, and, and for the rest of the audience, just a couple of things. I went to their website, and there's a couple of very interesting things on their website. They explain... You know, what is the reason for the grading of races? And they talk about why try to remember which race is better than or inferior to another. Let the graded system do that for you. I don't think it works, personally, as well as it should. And then they also talk about judgment and flexibility must always be part of the system. And I'm not making this up. This is on their website. Yet I don't think they follow, they practice what they preach. I don't see the judgment. I don't see the flexibility. We talked about the Arkansas Derby. I have brought up for years and years how the Oak Tree Breeders' Cup Mile never got an upgrade. In a period of four consecutive years in the Oak Tree Mile, it was won by Hawksley Hill, Silic, Warchant, and Val Royal. That same year, they went on to run in the Breeders' Cup Mile, far and away the finest mile race in North America by a hundred lengths. They ran second, first, first, and first. So if you're going to show flexibility and judgment and you miss something well, like that? No, you know, I mean, I, I, you, I, come, I come at that from a different perspective than does Mark. You, you, can, you can find any, this is a massive undertaking. They brought order to the stakes calendar when they started this thing, okay? I think by and large, they do a very, very good job. They've made some awful omissions. We both thought that Diana was overlooked for many years. The oak tree is a good point. How you can miss a major Kentucky Derby prep on the Kentucky Derby prep trail as with the Arkansas Derby, I agree again. But in general, there has to be some judgment. There just has to be, okay? They judge that the three new Breeders' Cup races aren't ones. That may have been a good call. On and on we go. 
you have to bring some organization when you're talking about buying and selling horses right. on the open market. Right. You have to bring some organization. They can always be better. They'll never be perfect. But if you do follow it, and I happen to, and you follow it <laughs> as a fan, okay, more or less, it stands up. There are glaring errors. There's no question about it. Is there favoritism? Could be, but I'm glad we have a graded stake system. I, re I really am. So, Pat, uh, we did yeah. have someone on, and, and if I'm incorrect in the name, I apologize. I think it was Andy Schweigart, and uh, it's very possible, you know, if they agree, that we may have someone yeah, on no, that, in the that's, future. That, you know, I hope they're yeah. willing to talk about it. From Delia, hi, Mark and Mike. Loved hearing from Charlie Hayward last week, just wish he had better news. He does, too. I also had read... The article by Fred LeBron in the Times Union for a few hours felt upbeat about the future of New York racing. A couple of weeks ago, during the 11 o'clock news on a network channel on Saturday night, I saw a commercial for Capital Play. My jaw dropped as the camera panned barn areas and grandstand seats in various states of disrepair, peeling paint and all. I've been a race tracker for 30 years and I have never experienced any Naira facility in such a poor state. The commercial went on to apply that this is the normal condition of the tracks under Naira's care, then continued to talk about Naira's bankruptcy and debt without mentioning Naira's giving up the ownership of the land nor the reason why Naira is under such financial distress. This week I received a mailing from Senator Bruno informing me that he is, quote here, leading the fight for Saratoga, end quote, that he is, open quote, committed to addressing the future of racing, close quote, while slamming the New York Assembly and the governor. The mailing directed me to Senator Bruno's website where I should sign his online petition. I visited his website expecting to be able to view his quote, plan, the same plan I guess that Charlie Hayward still has not seen. But there was no plan there. I don't really know what the petition is for, so I chose not to sign it. I did, though, email Senator Bruno my thoughts on the subject. Senator Bruno's Albany office number is in the 518 area code 455-3191. Again, 455-3191. And his website is www.senatorbrunoonerunonword.com. His mailing encouraged me to contact him. I suggest your viewers do the same. I know I did. And Delia, actually, we got some good news this morning that Delia um, got a call back from Senator Bruno's office. So, you know, I think that's a very, very positive thing. So, you know, if you folks are sitting out there saying, what's the point of me, you know, doing anything because they're not going to pay attention or they're not going to call me back. I can't guarantee you they're going to call you back. But Delia did get a call back from Senator Bruno's office, and that's great. Okay. Mark and Mike, this is from our friend Glenn in Louisiana. I was there last night, <laughs> Glenn, here, of course. Just wanted to remind Mark that the fifth running of the $1 million grade three Delta jackpot, soon to be a two, is coming <laughs> this Friday, <laughs> December 7th. To add to your discomfort, Mark, next year's Delta <laughs> Princess for juvenile fillies has received a grade three status as well. Seriously, I enjoy down the stretch each week. While we may not have Cerro Quali racing in Louisiana, it is nice to see quality horses perform in the jackpot in December, Louisiana Downs' is Super Derby in September, and Fairgrounds multiple graded stakes during winter months each year. I couldn't agree with you more. Heck, last year, Bob Baffert saddled second place finisher Pirates Deputy and had very favorable comments about his inaugural Delta Downs and Southwest Louisiana visit. So please look over pre-entries and offer your comments. My wife and I are attending and look forward to an exciting evening of races next Friday. Folks, exciting is an understatement from what you're gonna see. Again, thanks for a great show and the guests each week. And thank you, Glenn. Thank you so much, uh, Glenn. And last evening, as Glenn mentioned, the yeah. fifth edition of the Grade 3 Delta Jackpot, where the three to two betting favorite was number four Z Humor from Hall of Famer Bill Mott. As I said on last week's show, I was looking forward to the performance of Caves Valley. He was 7-2. Yeah, to two. For the call of the fifth running of the million dollar Delta jackpot to Delta Downs and Don Stevens. Enjoy it. And they're off in the Delta jackpot stakes. Look like a perfect start for all. Betatron broke sharply from down at the rail. St. Joe is moving right up in the middle of the track, advancing as well as Z-Humor between horses. It's Cujo also right there near the outside Caves Valley. They're stepping onto the main track now, and it's St. Joe who's going to set the pace. He's established a two-length lead. Z-Humor moves from between horses to be second. Betatron is at the rail. On the outside, you'll find Cujo in Caves Valley. Then it's a break of nearly six back to over 
overextended, followed by Golden Yank at the rail, take the money near the outside, Race Car Rhapsody is second last, and it's four more back to Turf War, who brings up the rear. The quarter mile went in a rapid 22 and one fifth seconds. St. Joe has the lead under Rafael Bejarano. Two horses fighting for second. Caves Valley on the outside. Z Yuma right down at the rail. Length and a quarter. Betatron is laying fourth. The half went in 45 and four fifth seconds. Cujo not able to keep up with that hot pace. He is dropping back in mid pack, and now he's going to be passed by Overextended, who is on the move. Golden Yank is at the mail at the rail, advancing as well. Race Car Rhapsody and Alvarado starting to get closer from the back of the pack. Then it's Take the Money and Turf Wars. They're reaching the far turn. Up front, St. Joe. He is now attacked on the inside by Z Humor. Caves Valley trying to hang in there. In traffic is Golden Yank. He had nowhere to go. Splitting horses now. That's Betatron. Hung out wide is overextended. Race Car Rhapsody still has five lengths to come. And the long shot Turf War angles off the rail as they come for home. Three quarters win in one. 11 and four. They're into the stretch. Z Humor has the lead on the outside coming on strong now that is turf war between horses it's golden yank a three-way driving finish too tight to call <laughs> i'll say it was too tight to call on the inside is the favorite z humor on the outside is turf war under calvin at 39 to 1 and between them is the local golden yank what a finish z humor <laughs> turf war and they hit the wire together and in the million dollar delta jackpot it's a dead heat between the three to two <coughs> favorite and the 39 to one long shot golden yank the local was beaten only a neck gerard Malasson, his jockey yes, foul yeah. against both the other <laughs> horses nightmare. <laughs> it was disallowed but how ironic yeah. is it oh. that turf war ridden by calvin yeah. burrell who was referred to, as you know, yeah. as Calvin Borrell, got fans so wide turning for home. Yeah. And that, you know, incredibly short stretch yeah. at Delta Downs, yeah. that's what cost him the race. I think it did. And it's interesting. Oh. He came, and we're in Louisiana, came from all the way up north at Woodbine. But, folks, uh, you know, I like to do pedigree here. If you didn't know, this is a younger full brother to Grasshopper who ran right. so well against Street Sense in the Travers. A real exciting renewal of the Delta jackpot. I did enjoy it, and I'm with Glenn. It's nice to have a small track, have a big day or a big weekend of racing. And I think there were some pretty good two-year-olds in there. We kind of have a line of class through Z Humor who did what most people thought he would do. But I'm with Mark. I thought uh, he gave up four or five lengths on the top, and you oh. can't do that there. No way, no how. But Golden Yank, I'm going to make sure I follow him as well. Two guys each got three hundred thousand dollars for the Dubry Trail here. Four hundred thousand. Is that what it is? Four hundred. Yeah, they split eight hundred thousand. That's what they. Dollars. That's right. They split. Yeah, that's one not and too two. Not too bad. A mm. very poor effort from Caves Valley. I mm. thought he was going to run big in here. He was setting a good trip and was absolutely empty at the far turn. Please make a note of this. Um, in here, obviously, with those incredibly fast fractions yeah, and were. benefited they, horses they, coming yes. from behind. Race Car Rhapsody ran fourth, but I didn't think it was a very good effort. And he rallied for third in the Kentucky Jockey Club, and I didn't think it was a particularly good effort that day either. So, you know, I'm um, Race Car Rhapsody, even though he's been third and fourth in his last couple of starts, I'm not jumping through hoops over him. But congratulations to the connections of both Z yeah. Humor and Turf War, the winners of the fifth <laughs> renewal of the grade three one million dollar delta jackpot thanks to glenn uh, for sending the email and to pat and delian for those of you who would like to correspond with us here at down the stretch here are the ways in which you can do that through the united states postal service down the stretch mark in my capital district otb <coughs> 510 smith schenectady 12305 or electronically at viewer mail <coughs> at capital otb.com in um in Glenn's email, he mentioned, you know, Bob Baffert having gone down there last year and having enjoyed it so much. Yeah. Of course, yeah. you know, I think the main reason for the enjoyment was the million dollars they put up. But uh, some news about Bob Baffert. I want to get something cleared up here. You may have read some things about Bob Baffert and his eligibility for Racing's Hall of Fame. A number of people have written that Bob Baffert will be, for the first time, <coughs> eligible for the Hall of Fame in 2007. I'm sorry, in 2008, excuse me. Others have written that he shouldn't be eligible as it is 
because he wasn't a full-time thoroughbred trainer for a number of years. Let's take those two topics separately. Number one, Bob Baffert was eligible for Racing's Hall of Fame in 2007, but he did not make the ballot. That is correct. Okay, so please understand that. If you <coughs> that read correct. that next year's his first year of eligibility, that is inaccurate. That's right. Now, let's quickly address what is the rule allowing the, trainers eligibility? This for the 25 year. years, okay, 25 years. And as, if you're a thoroughbred trainer for 25 years, you are eligible. That's the rule. Keep going. I know no you, minimum I know you've got number of starts. Or no, there are not any that. minimum. It is a very flat, clear okay. rule. If you've been training for 25 years, you're eligible. You want to go further, or do you no, want me I mean, to pick you, it up? Because you know, basically, <clears throat> Bob Baffert, in a number of those years, right. was a quarter horse trainer as well, right. and only saddled a few thoroughbreds. That is right. But there's no. Oh no! It's simply if you have your license. You've got your license, okay. and you're training. And so he sure. is eligible. You can train one thoroughbred one year in your first year, and if you're training thoroughbreds 24 years later. You're eligible. Okay. Yeah. So I that's, just wanted, that's the rule. Yeah. yeah where's that, there's no nuances there. The yeah. nuances come in the process getting to the ballot, but not eligibility. He is eligible. Okay. Absolutely. And he, and he was in 2007. And he simply didn't make the ballot. And I mean, so. what what I think I think I'll do it when we have the chance here is there. You are going to read for those of you who follow this process. You will read points and counterpoints about whether or not those years should be counted. Well, they are counted. I mean, if the rule wants to be changed, that's a whole nother yeah. ball game. You'll hear criticisms and, you know, I think favorable comments too, but that's where this discrepancy has arisen. And a gentleman who Mr. Baffert may be facing in an attempt to get on the ballot Without in question. 2008, Without question. trainer Carl Navsger for the second time <laughs> has been voted the Big Sport of Turfdom Award presented by the Turf Publicists of America. Carl made himself available to the press. And folks, I think we had him on this show at least a half a dozen times this yeah. year. And this is a small production. So it gives you an idea really how Carl feels about working with the press yep. and with the racing fans and I think it's a very well deserved I think it's honor. well deserved he got it with unbridled in 1990 he's a member of the Texas Horse Racing Hall of Fame he's just he's a great guy and this is very very well deserved and very popular I'm sure very quickly since we had Charlie Hayward on one week ago What's been happening in Albany? Well, something finally is happening. At least that's what I'm hearing. And uh, I, think, I think we can say that finally there are what should be described as serious talks amongst the political leaders as to just what to do about this um, hot potato that's been boiling for several years now. Um, there are expectations that something will be announced this week. Uh, I can only use the word expectations because I don't know any more than that. There are some particulars that have come out. You've maybe read some of them online. Uh, there is the senator's demand for any number of scenarios, including a frightening and, in my word, off-the-wall idea that the state somehow should control the simulcast picture for the New York Racing or New York Racing, if it's not going to be New York Racing Association. Uh, an old demand is back in the news again or back among staff talks. That is that the Naira board resign. Um, you, you know, but I, I, think, I think the main thing for us this morning is, for the first time, I think in a long time, there are, to my understanding, serious talks going on. Where they go, I don't know. <clears throat> Hopefully over the next uh, six or seven days, uh, something of, you know, some substance will come out of this. And if it does, we'll try to get somebody yeah. on the show next Saturday for you to update you on what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Last week's show, uh, I wanted to show you this maiden race from closing day at, at Churchill Downs, and we simply didn't have time. This was a fascinating race for two-year-old males going <clears> seven-eighths <throat> of a mile. And listen to some of the barns who had runners in here. You think this was This was know, one of those well -meant, well meant races, absolutely. Let's yep. see. Nick Zito. Yeah. Steve Asmussen, Bobby Frankel, Todd Pletcher, Dale Romans, Carl Navsger, and Wayne Lucas. Well, forget all of them. I want you to focus on a first-timer from David Carroll, number 10, Dennis of York. At the top of your screen, he's next to last in the fuchsia and teal silks of William Warren Jr. Remember St. Liam from a few years back? Well, after settling early toward the back of the pack, he is about to commence an eye-catching <clears throat> outside rally around the turn. Take a look at this as he sets sail. And he's going to lose some ground around the turn, 
But, uh, you know, this is pretty good looking. He's going to collar the favorite, number five, stung by the storm in upper stretch, and he's going to go on to a three-quarter length score. Off a half and 45 and three, and three quarters and 10 and one, he's going to stop the teletimer in 122 and two. Now, where he only beat the second finisher by three quarters of a length, he defeated the third finisher, number six, Major General, by eight lengths. So it figured to be, it, it, it turned out to be a two horse race. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Carl Navsger had a first-time starter in here for Jim Taffel. Mm -hmm. Who would you guess rode that first-time starter for Navsger well, and Taffel? Well, got to be him. Okay, well, yeah. Calvin Burrell didn't ride okay. for Navsger and Taffel. Okay. He rode the winner. Okay. The winner from David Carroll, who has endured a very tough meet at Churchill. David, the exercise rider for Easy Goer from a few decades back. He says that Dennis of Cork will reappear next in a fairgrounds allowance. Okay. Folks, they paid a quarter of a million dollars for the son of Harlan's holiday. He did not show any blazing workouts in the morning leading up to his debut. And when he went across the line, he reminded me so much of a young okay. unbridled. Yeah. Now, I just said he's a son of Harlan's holiday, but the dam is unbridled girl by unbridled. Sure, sure. Let's take a look at a comparison. There's Dennis of Cork on the bottom. There's it. Unfortunately, we're, we weren't able to get a shot. Thanks to Pat Peretta for doing this. Weren't able to get a shot of unbridled when he was a baby, when he was a two-year-old. Uh, <coughs> but I swear, Dennis well, of Cork looks just like him. The thing that the thing that draws my attention to it is is. Uh, when we were watching the stretch run, I can tell you what it does remind me of. Unbridled is known to have been and to get runners who are very tall and straight up yeah. front. And when you were looking at him coming down, whereas the other guys are low and reaching, he's up like this. So there's no question that that's part of the genetic makeup of this guy. And if he's got the other aspects of it, this is going to be a good horse. Well, <laughs> so. David Carroll not yeah. known for sending out first out winners. Horse yeah. didn't show very him. much in the mornings. Jot down the name, Good Dennis of Cork, uh, and we will uh, look forward to seeing him this winter at the fairgrounds. All right, we are up to our first break on this morning's December 8th edition of Down the Stretch. Thank you so much for having joined us. When Michael and I return, we will welcome in our first guest of the morning, two-time Eclipse Award winning photographer, Barbara Livingston, as we go to this break. Last Sunday in New York, <coughs> snowy New York, Ozone Park, the personal bid. On paper, it looked like a two Philly race between number nine, Light Tactic, and number one, Brown Eyed Bell. So we'll take a look at the personal bid going to the break. Michael and I will be back with Barbara Livingston right after these messages. And they're off. Brown Eyed Bell racing for the lead. On the far outside, Light Tactic is there. And between those two goes Love Cove, now third. And then it's Smoke and Sarah racing fourth. And on the inside, Sunset Cocktail fifth by three with a wink is win with the wink is running in sixth position. And the break of another four back to Street Sass and Becky's Flute up the back stretch. Brown Eyed Bell off the rail with the lead through a 23 and two quarter. Sunset Cocktail on the fence in second. In between horses, Smoke and Sarah. On the outside, Love Cove runs in fourth. Just being behind them, it's Light Tactic running in fifth and a break of another three back to win with the wink. Still at the back, our street sass and Becky Sloot coming to the top of the stretch. And Brown Eyed Bell off the turn, clear by three. Sunset Cocktail in an all-out drive, still second as they approach the eighth pole. And then it's Light Tactic third toward the rail. The others too far behind, one furlong to go. Brown Eyed Bell still there, Sunset Cocktail and Light Tactic both gaining ground. Here comes Light Tactic as Brown Eyed Bell stops just outside the 70-yard pole. It is light tactic on the wire. Won it by three. Close photo for second, Brown Eyed Bell or Sunset Cocktail, then Street says. This is the OTV Television Network.
Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. Mike Veach to my left. I'm Marcus Sano. The personal bid goes to Light Tactic for Rick Schasberg and Ramon Dominguez by an expanding three and a half lengths over Brown Eyed Bell. Some of the post race quotes. It was fascinating. Shasberg called her a nutcase. She's <laughs> well, a whack job. You know, well, she can run a little bit. She can bit. run, but she decided to do it her own way yeah. if you watch that tape. <laughs> <laughs> Our first guest this morning, as I mentioned, is a two-time Eclipse Award winning photographer. Folks, she's one of the best in the game. Her newest book is More Old Friends, and she's an old friend of ours. We welcome to the program this morning, Barbara Livingston. Barbara, welcome back to Down the Stretch. Hi, good morning, Mark and Mike. Hello, Thanks Barbara. So much. How are you, dear? We're honored to have you. Thanks so much. It's, it's a little early for me, but it's okay. I set the alarm. <laughs> oh, no. I know. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, as I mentioned, the newest book is More Old Friends. Tell our audience what's it all about. Well, a few years back, I decided to go around the country and photograph some of older horses that had been top campaigners that people might remember, more so than just the famous ones, although I did include Affirmed and John Henry and some other great, great ones, ones that people might just barely remember, like Dr. Patches, but that people would remember just fondly with what bet they might have made on them or what horse of theirs they might have ever just really loved. So the reception to that was so warm that we decided to do a follow-up, and we just it just came out, and it's 100 horses of note. Some are very famous, such as Storm Catter Miesque, and then again, others are are not so well known and it was really fun to uncover their stories. Well that's wonderful. Barbara, in a moment we're going to take a look at some of the photographs in the book and as a photograph comes up on the screen mm -hmm. please tell our audience who it is and you know maybe your remembrances of the photograph or um, you know maybe some of the personalities uh, of the horses involved. Let's take a look. Let's get started here with this shot. And Barbara, see it, as soon as you see it up on the screen, let us know who that is. Oh, sure. A lot of back backstretch people here would know this horse or people that bet at Saratoga. It's an old jump campaigner named Mickey Free. Mm. And Mickey Free won up here at Saratoga, I believe, in 1988 for Tom Voss, and that's Tom Voss holding him. But what Mickey Free became more well-known for, other than being the Maryland-bred jumper of the year in 1988, he became Tom's stable pony up here at Saratoga. And he was here for almost 20 years in a row. And basically, every jockey agent, every valet, everyone that could get on the backstretch that had a child would would come on back and visit Mickey Free, and they'd just pop that kid aboard. And poor Mickey Free just got so he'd barely even flick his ears. He'd go wherever he was, <laughs> yeah. sort of like somebody at a, at a candy store, just hop on the horse and take him wherever you want. So Mickey was quite a mainstay. He just was retired maybe three years ago and replaced by John's call. Okay. So that's not a bad replacement. No, no. sir. <laughs> this is a magnificent photograph. Oh, this now you. white horse, who is this? That would be Darn That Alarm, wow. who was a grade one winner years and years yeah. ago down in Florida. And he became a perennial a favorite of people in Florida and stayed down there throughout his stud career. Um, he started two grade one winners in his first crop, never sired him again. But for him, part of the fun of him was that as a two-year-old, I believe it was, he went in the starting gate for his second race or first race, broke through. He ended up breaking his knees. He did something else at the farm where he broke something. Mm. I, I wrote the book a while ago, so I'm actually sort of yeah. forgetting parts of it. But he still came back to be a grade one winner. And we were thrilled to photograph him. He was just as exciting as that picture looks. Wow. He was happy and loving. And uh, two months later, he perished in a fire in the barn oh, right behind him. That is just a that is just a fabulous shot. Uh, Thank you. He was just magnificent, and that groom let him out in his paddock. The horse galloped off. The groom whistled to him, and the horse ran right oh, back up. How and about said, that? What do you want? <laughs> All right, Barbara. Who are we looking at now? Here's a horse that a lot of New Yorkers will remember. That would be Dave's friend. Oh yeah. Who set her equal perhaps nine track records and won an amazing number of stakes, obviously. Um, he trained here and down in Maryland and was a perennial favorite. And he was a gelding, so John Franks bought him at one point, maybe when he was seven or eight, raced him a few more years, then retired him down to his farm in Louisiana, where the horse stayed. And for the first book, I photographed a Louisiana horse named Monique Rene. And when I went to visit Monique Rene, John Franks said to me, this horse is fine and all, but I sure wish you'd photograph Dave's friend, because he's my best friend ever. Okay. Wow. So nice. Dave's friend was 30 when we took that, and he, he had a lot of infirmities, uh, but he stood really proudly. We had to, real trouble getting his head up that high for a photo because he had a breathing issue mm -hmm. 
for the last 10 or 15 years of his life where his head couldn't really raise too high without discomfort. Mm. So he was a kind model and did anything we asked of him. And I, I really miss him. He was just a beautiful animal. 30 years mm. of age. That's amazing in itself. It was really, the best part was the gentleman sent me an email the week before I visited and said, I've been working on him, but it's hard to make him look like the racehorse he once was. And Barbara, who is this peering uh, out of his stall? Another horse that did well in New York and uh, in other spots of the country as well, Forever Silver. Yes. Oh, sure. Yes. Yes. And, and Forever Silver became a nice sire here. He was a grade one winner, a, a Whitney horse. And he had a lot of personality. He was very strong, and uh, he was sort of tough. He wasn't really an easy customer to work with, but he was just magnificent, as magnificent a horse as I've ever seen. Reminded me a lot of Darn That Alarm, like could have been a Lipizzan. Mm, wow. And um, this photo actually... This one also, he had a bittersweet. I got in contact with Cornell, and it was about a week before they were to euthanize him because he was in discomfort, okay. a lot of discomfort. That's him the day before he was euthanized, actually. Okay. Wow. And we managed to get him to, to pose that beautifully because we posed a gelding down the aisle for him. Oh. And he got very excited thinking he might date that gelding. <laughs> 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 I remember him so well because actually he was owned in part by an old friend of mine and Skippy Shapoff. Uh, trained him so Barbara as we take a look at a few more shots we're gonna go over what you know when you look through your lens and you're about to photograph a horse can, can you feel different personalities looking back at you absolutely I, I'm sort of challenged with people I can't say that I can really tell much about one person from the other and I but with animals and horses especially I think I worked with them when I was young, so I grew up around them, worked mm -hmm. with them down in a Paul Kant's polo fields down in Burnt Hill. So I grew up just knowing that each one was so unique. And somehow the, the minute you get them out there and you let them start to strut their stuff or you can find them, they, they know exactly what to do for you. And they, mm -hmm. Everyone is as unique as a snowflake. Barbara, who are some of your personal favorites that you've photographed over the years, whether they were you know, extremely popular or, uh, you know, horses that might not, uh, and, and, and here's a shot on the screen of three horses. Who are some of your favorites that have photographed over the years? Yeah, those, those three horses, I'd say any one of those three would have counted towards some of my favorites. Yeah. Um, that's Personal Ensign yeah. on the left, yeah. who is incredible to photograph due to her spirit and obviously her determination and her ability to come back from injury. And that is her with her daughter, My Flag, who was sort of a nut job, which made her fun to <laughs> yeah. photograph. And then her granddaughter, Storm Flag Flying, oh, over on the oh, right, yes. who was perhaps oh, even more nutty, which made for <laughs> really great photographs. <laughs> and your personality obviously plays a hand. Sometimes you like them because they're so kind. And with these three, you like them because they were such on-edge athletes, mm -hmm. but who also could perform in remarkable fashion, To obviously with the fifth stable silks, which just, if that doesn't inspire a photographer or an artist, shame on us. So. Yeah. So that's certainly, among racehorses, I liked Light the Fuse because he was so darn fast and Julie Crone was so funny. Mm -hmm. I loved Gander, was a big favorite. It was uh, obviously the gray element is fun. Turn Back the Alarm was another gray who was so easy to photograph. Um, they're just, every year almost, somebody comes along that really just steals your heart. Oh, and the picture on the screen now, talk about a horse steal your heart. I've, obviously, I've just submitted the sad pictures to you. That is precisionist. Oh, who was an okay. unbelievable wow. Hall of Fame campaigner. And that also, we called the farm the day before he was euthanized, just out of the blue. Wow. And wow. that is him the day before his passing at Old Friends in Kentucky. And Precisionist was a fantastic model. He also wow. would do, he was the most willing horse. There couldn't have been a more willing model. Well, Barbara, as always, you know, I these are one. some absolutely fantastic shots. Um, we are getting very close to Christmas. There are folks, yeah. you know, looking for Christmas ideas and, you know, they may want to get the book for themselves, but let the audience know where they can get <clears throat> more old friends. What's the easiest way for them to pick it up? I found, even though it's published by Eclipse Press, which does a great job, Amazon.com gives a great discount. Mm -hmm. The book is generally $30. Amazon sells it for just under 20 And they have free shipping if you get two or more, if you get $25 yeah. worth of items. So I often buy things through Amazon. Yeah. And, and it does make a great gift because it not only tells their stories now, but it, it reminds people of their racing careers. So that is my shameless plug. Well, that's, <laughs> hey, listen. That's as much as I could ever do. That's, <laughs> folks. 
She is one of the most <clears throat> talented people that I know. This is the newest book, Moral Friends. Go to Amazon.com. I'm, you know, twenty dollars. My God, and uh, get a couple for friends, and make sure you get one for yourself. Um, Barbara, before I let you go, yeah. I have to tell the audience: this summer at Saratoga, I got to meet Barbara's mom for the first time. Great. <laughs> Great. I was, Barbara will remember the story. We were walking out of the clubhouse going toward the paddock. Yeah. And Barbara stopped me and said, I, I, you know, I want to introduce you to my mom. That's And great. I said to her mother, you know, your daughter's one of the most talented people I've ever met. And she turned, first time she'd ever met me. Yeah. And she said to me, um, I'm trying to, to remember exactly what she said to me. Well, of course, she got it from me. <laughs> And, you know, from I, that point on, you got it. Well, yeah, she had me. That's, that's, I mean, that was good. it. <laughs> so, I got one question. That was for. terrific. <laughs> you guys are great. And it's funny because my mom can't take photos or draw or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but she has her talent. Well, she did the most important thing, Barbara. So. <laughs> You're great. You guys are great. Thank you so much. But I have one question for you, Barbara. It, it might be a bit of a tough one, but uh, I see you, you know, as a admire of your work and and the way you go about your business uh, I do have a tough question for you um, you are in my opinion in a unique position going to the places you go to make sort of an assessment about our game and very frequently we get emails here people who are worried about the health of racing so I'm going to ask you a health of racing question not about the people on the inside but your sense of where thoroughbred racing is at this point um, you know m make a comment for us if you will Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a hugely interesting question yeah. and, and a big question for a little photographer. Yeah. Um, I see a lot wrong with the game, obviously, mm. and, and we're certainly publicizing that in a way we've never done before. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the issues I deal with most are people writing to me about anti-slaughter, about horse rescue. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I get maybe three or four emails daily about, yeah. asking for donations. But the fact that people weren't asking for those donations 20 years ago and now there is that public awareness, okay. and we're working toward cleaning up whatever we think, Good. whatever we perceive is broken. I actually, although sometimes people ask, is racing cruel? And mm. there certainly are aspects that are not beautiful, mm. but I do feel we have accountability that was lacking before. Good. I do think that we can move forward with the product in a beautiful, positive way, and I just don't see it ending, certainly right. the way that we know it in my lifetime, and I certainly hope that by my capturing the beauty of it, I do my little tiny part to help keep the positive aspects going forward as, as well as the negative aspects are covered so heavily in our sport. I'm glad to hear Barbara Livingston say that. Barbara, it was really a pleasure to have you this morning. Mike, are you enjoying the snow? Uh, uh, listen, I'm in complete heaven right now. I, I'll, if you need me, I'm at the East Side Rec this afternoon after the show. <laughs> That's a good no I'll be sitting here with the fireplace. Thank you. You've yes. made his day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Barbara. Barbara, as always, uh, thank you so much. Uh, happy holidays to you and your family, and all the best with more old friends. Thank you so much, guys, and, and, and happy holidays to everyone. Take care. Thanks, Same Barbara. You, Barbara. Barbara Livingston, ladies and gentlemen, Amazon.com, more old friends. She's also got Barbara Livingston, Saratoga, yeah. with some wonderful photographs mm -hmm. of your town. You know, where it's summertime like four months a year, and she's got winter <laughs> shots in there as well. But go to Amazon.com. You know, think about it. In our area alone, yeah. we have two Eclipse Award winning photographers oh. in Barbara Livingston and Skip Dickstein. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's really country, saying yeah. an awful lot. Sure All right. We are up to our final break on this morning's uh, December 8th edition of Down the Stretch. Thank you so much for having joined us. When Michael and I return, it is opening day at Tampa Bay Downs, and we will welcome in their Vice President of Marketing and Publicity, Margot Flynn, to talk to us about the Oldsmar, Florida track, where I can guarantee it's a lot warmer than it is here yes, today. Can. As we go to this break, last Saturday at Aqueduct, the Garland of Roses where the Fortify favorite was number two, Oprah Winnie. And on the inner dirt, you better get a pretty clean trip. So we'll take a look at the Garland of Roses going to the break. Michael and I will be back with Margot Flynn right after these messages. And they're off. Lakes Tune, the fastest out of there, followed by more angels, Oprah Winnie, down toward the rail, toward the outside control system, farthest out, Caracorm Starlet, and the early trailer, is Cash's girl up the back stretch, and it is Lakes Tune the leader. Control system 
On the chase, running in second, Caracorum Starlet, third on the outside. On the rail, more angels. And then Oprah Winnie bottled up on the inside for the moment. Cassius Girl, the trailer. It was a 23 flat opening quarter around the far turn. Lakes tune on top, right alongside control system. Caracorum Starlet running in third. More angels. Oprah Winnie still at the fence. And Cassius Girl right alongside her. They turn for home, top of the stretch now, and control system up for a short lead. Lakes Tuna has now given way back in second. Coming on in between horses is more angels, Caracorm Starlet. Now there's finally running room for Oprah Winnie on the outside, but she's four lengths behind with the 16th to go, and they're coming down to the line, and it is control system. Control system, the winner by three. More angels was second, Oprah Winnie was third. This is the OTB Television Network. Back to Down the Stretch, everyone. Mike Veach to my left. I'm Mark Asano. The Garland of Roses goes to control system for Mike Trombet and A. Barcoa by two and three quarters over more angels. Oprah Winnie third, a somewhat troubled trip. You know, when you run the last quarter mile under 24 seconds and you're where Oprah Winnie was turning mm -hmm. for home, you got mm -hmm. no chance. Mm -hmm. All right. It is opening day of the 82nd season of racing today at Tampa Bay Downs on the west coast of Florida where they have thrived in recent years. And joining us this morning is their Vice President of Marketing and Publicity, Margo Flynn. Margo, Mark Cassano, and Mike Veach welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Good morning, Margo. Margo, Good morning. how is it in an era where so <laughs> many tracks are experiencing problems, Tampa Bay Downs has been thriving. How have you accomplished that? I think we're very fortunate to have a mix of um, horse flesh from all over the country, which makes it very appealing to the um, betters. Uh, we have full fields. We have an outstanding turf course. We've been able to reduce our takeout for the fourth consecutive year. And um, it's just been a win-win situation for everyone involved. Margo, you put that turf course in, you know, my memory's not what it used to be, but, you know, about 10 years ago, and turf course is critical to helping racing secretaries uh, fill fields. Yes, it is. The, the turf course has really been something that's um, helped us be able to put out an outstanding product. We've been able to attract a, a high level of competition as trainers, jockeys, and um, a lot of people are very, very complimentary about the, the way that the turf course is maintained, and um, they just love it. And we've been very blessed with the weather, obviously, as well. <laughs> and more recently, Marco, I know you added a seven furlong shoot on the main track, Perfect. and obviously that gives trainers that many more options. That's right. We did have a seven furlong shoot. What we did was change the configuration. 
it used to be a dog leg, um, and now it is a straightaway, which gives us the opportunity to run six, six and a half, and seven out of the chute, and it's been a very popular advantage uh, uh, avenue, and also um, the six and a half furlongs is something new for us as well with the advent of that chute. Margo, you mentioned briefly reduced takeout on a number of your wagers. Um, be a little bit more specific with our audience. What kind of takeout reductions and on which wagers? Well, on the pick um, four, the reduction was from 25% down to 20 so that was significant. But the pick um, three and four will now be 20%. We um, decreased the takeout on win place and show that um, was taken from 18 down to 17 and a half percent and we have a new pick six this year as well so um, every year we've tried to make some adjustments in that regard and um, you know I think it's been well received by the patrons and we try to, to give back to them as well earlier in the program we were talking about the graded stakes committee Tampa Bay Downs has uh, received a couple of new uh, graded stakes uh, for the <coughs> upcoming year talk to our audience about that if you would Yes, for the first time in, in Tampa Bay's history, we have four grade three events. We have the Endeavor Stakes, which is in February, and that's for Phillies and Mares on the Turf, which was newly upgraded to three. And we also have the Florida Oaks, which has been regraded at grade three. So we're, we're very fortunate. On Tampa Bay Derby Day, we'll have the grade three Tampa Bay Derby, the grade three Hillsboro, which is on the turf, and now, um, once again, the Florida Oaks has received the grade three status. And it's just a testament to the quality of horses that we have come through here every year. Margo, you mentioned the Tampa Bay Derby. We're about to take a look at the very exciting stretch run from earlier this year in the Tampa Bay Derby with Street Sense along the inside and any given Saturday on the outside. Talk to our audience about what this one race, drawing those two absolutely outstanding three-year-olds to your Oldsmar facility, did for you. Um, we had been on the upswing as far as attracting um, quality horses in the past, and we've been given um, Bluegrass Cat the year before. So we've been very, very fortunate with the success of these horses. Um, but this year put us into a whole new league with Street Sense obviously going on to win the Kentucky Derby and the success of any given Saturday winning the Haskell. And, and it was just you know very exciting to be around them both. And um, the stretch run here at Tampa, we couldn't have asked for a better finish. Mm. That uh, truly was amazing, and, and, and I do think in its own way, uh, you know, it, it, it really helped put you on the map, and Margo, you have one huge advantage at the present time over Gulfstream Park on the East Coast, and that is you can run mile and a sixteenth dirt races, and they've decided against that, and that's got to help you out an awful lot. Yes, it does. Obviously, um, we were able to, uh, that, I think Street Sense wanted the distance, and that's, um, you know, that's why he came here, because of the mile on the 16th. So, you know, it's very, very valuable. We're, we're very happy with the way things have turned out, obviously. And, um, you know, we try to make the best of each and every situation. We've put our stake schedule together with that in mind, the forces going on to um, bigger and better things, and we have a gradual system now with the Sam Davis, um, and the, the Tampa Bay Derby being a month apart seems to work out well for a lot of trainers to come up here and, and bring their horses to participate. And I appreciate the mile and the 16th distance. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Good. I'll have a couple of closing questions for you, but for right now, here's my partner, Mike Veach. Margo, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our audience up here, which is interested in your product. Uh, just a couple of questions, if you will, dealing with... Uh, what are trends in thoroughbred racing? And the first has to do with the trend, although the brakes might be on a little bit, with synthetic surfaces. Is that in any part of the thinking at Tampa Bay right now? Uh, to tell you the truth, we probably have one of the best um, surfaces in the country, yeah. and it's sand. Yeah. So uh, there is really no um, immediate thought of changing that um, at all. And I think you're right. The jury's out on, on the synthetic surfaces. And the other question, Margo, is uh, the idea of a slots component to the racetrack. Is that any part of your thinking for the near future? Well, I would say that we certainly don't want it to be in someone else's thinking. Um, mm -hmm. We would, you know, if it's going to be in Florida, we are in our county. We need it to be at the racetrack. Um, we have just been granted the opportunity to have poker year round. We've been doing that for the last few months, okay. but it is. Um, certainly a day-to-day -day struggle 
and you know it has to if it's going to come into this area um, then it has to be at the racetrack otherwise it would certainly put us at a disadvantage um, but we strive every year to keep improving the product we put a lot of money into the, the mm-hmm. facility this year once again which is continual over the years to keep upgrading the facility and the product and um, you know giving back to the, the horsemen and to the patrons and you know that's been our commitment and reducing the takeout offering um, a higher stakes program. These are all components of that to make it successful. Boy, good for you folks. Here's Mark for a couple final questions, Margo, thanks. Margo, one you know, very, very important question. Uh, what's the current temperature uh, in, in oh, Oldsmar and what's the forecast for later this afternoon? Oh, it's dismal down here. Oh. It's a sunny 82. <laughs> and, <laughs> Oh. And um, fast and firm, so we're in for a glorious afternoon. <laughs> Your opening day feature is the Lightning City Stakes, a turf sprint for fillies and mares. I know you've got the defending champ, Bucky's Prayer, back. Margo, is she going to repeat, or do you like somebody else? <laughs> well, um, talking about horses in that race, there's a lot of speed in here, and Charlie Papa has never been defeated um, at Tampa. And, um, but another one of these speed horses, Avante came off the van from Scott Lake Barn this morning and um, looked very, very impressive. And um, Had He Be Good also has the opportunity, it doesn't have to be on the front end, and that may play into it, but I don't like its post position at all, coming from the outside. Uh, I am going to think that um, Avante um, might be tough on the front end, um, and Charlie Papa is going to try to battle it out. She is a, a warrior, and I, I, I think that she's certainly going to give it her all. And as I mentioned, she's never been defeated here, so I guess we don't want to start now. Um, and a long shot, picking up a piece from off the pace, I have, I'm going to throw in a message of a miss. Margo, will you be doing the paddock reports and the selections on the simulcast again this year? Yes, I will. Just one recommendation. If you're looking to draw more people down there, you know, to spend a, you know, a day or a week or whatever, sure. all you have to do is tell us that it's 82 <laughs> degrees <laughs> in sunny, and I want to jump on a plane immediately. Well, Margo, that's right. <laughs> Margo, first of all, congratulations yes, on all the agreed. success. Yep. I mean, it, it's been terrific uh, for Tampa Bay Downs. We look forward uh, to seeing your product throughout the long cold winter up here and thanks so much for having joined us this morning on down the stretch my pleasure and um don't forget about us this afternoon first race post is at twelve twenty-five. there we go we, we won't not. forget okay. you margo thanks again thank you margo Bye-bye. flynn Bye-bye. ladies and gentlemen the <clears throat> vice president of marketing and publicity of course you know i don't know why it is everybody's got to give me a little shot at this time of year you know last saturday uh, our colleague Bill Heller left me a message yeah. um, on my phone at home, and he said, "You must be out playing golf." Everybody wants to give me Marky, a little shot at this time of year. You've got to get with the program. Yeah, I'll get this with the program. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, final reminder for those of you who would like to get with the program, if yeah. you'd like to correspond <laughs> right. with us here at Down the Stretch, here are the ways in which you can do that through the United States Postal Service. Down the Stretch, Mark and Mike, Capital District OTB 510, Smith Schenectady. 12305 or electronically at viewer mail at capitalotb.com. Time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air. Dan Hayes directed, Kurt Fleck and Pete Persico and Pat Peretta and our associate producer Julie Hoxie. And special thanks to this morning's guests, Barbara Livingston. And don't forget, Amazon.com, more old friends. Pick it up for a couple of your rate close racing friends and pick up a copy for yourself. And to Margo Flynn. 82 degrees and sunny. Well, I, oh. I know that you're pining. So yes, I am. You know, you got a ways to go. Yes, I am. <laughs> if something critical happens, and, and hopefully it will, over the ensuing week in Albany, we'll try to get you somebody on next week to, you know, give you an update and explain to you what's going on. So have a good weekend. You too. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank yep. you so much for Thanks having for joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. We appreciate it. Enjoy all the racing action this afternoon, the opening of Tampa Bay Downs. Ravel and the Native Diver, all the action from coast to coast here at Capitol. Have a wonderful weekend and a terrific upcoming week. And Michael and I will see you next week.